Last week, we, we covered Romans 12, verse 1. That's as far as we got. And um, I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but we're not going to get a whole lot further. We're only going to get to Romans through Romans chapter 2, or excuse me, verse 2 of chapter 12 tonight. Um, last week, when we looked at Romans 12, 1, we talked last week about offering our, uh, offering our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, as an act of worship. And it's very interesting because what Paul does in these two verses, he ties these two things together so beautifully. But in verse 1, he talks about offering our bodies to Christ, to God as living sacrifice. And in verse 2, he talks about something that is massively important for us today uh, that we have to do on a daily basis over the course of our lives. And he talks about the mind. So he talks about offering our bodies, but now he talks about trans our, the transformation that comes into our lives by the renewing of our mind. And, and, and li the, listen, it's not, and I'm not talking about your brain, I'm talking about in your mind. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit more tonight. But, but this is where the greatest spiritual battles uh, of your life take place. They take place in your mind. For instance, if you, if you look at the book of Job, Job was attacked physically. We know that he was attacked physically by the enemy, but the battle that he fought was internal. The battle he fought was inside of himself about why, why is this going on? God, why am I having to deal with this? And, and he was fighting at the struggles and the stress that you're going through on the outside. That's not where the battle is really taking place. It, it hits us inside in the inner person. That, that's where the real battleground for our lives is. Also, according to the Bible, that's where the transformation takes place for the disciple of Jesus. The the ongoing transformation of the work of God in us takes place in our minds. And we're going to see that tonight. And so, so, so this is massively important. Uh, anxiety, desires, beliefs, attitudes, hopes, uh, loves, obsessions, all of that takes place inside of our minds, not on the outside. So, so last week we talked about offering our bodies to the Lord. This week we're going to talk about renewing our minds and being focused inward in that sense. So let me just read the verses we're looking at today. Romans 12, 1 and 2, they really go together. And although we're looking at verse 2, we're going to read them both together tonight. Um, but uh, let's read it together. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Covered that last week. If you missed it, you can find it. It's online. You can find it on Facebook. You can also find it on our website, restorationlifechurch.tv. You can find it there. Uh, but then, then uh, it carries forward. That verse carries forward and connects to verse 2. And verse 2 is, is really, in a sense, the result of verse 1. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good an acceptable and perfect will of God. So let's just pull verse 2 apart piece by piece. The first thing is, he says, it's very obvious, he says, do not be what? Okay, it's not a trick question. What does it say? Do not be conformed. conformed. Very good. Somebody yell it out nice and good. Way to go, Chuck. Um, do not be conformed to this world. Now, to be conformed is to change someone's behavior to be like something else. Uh, when I do that, now I'm conformed. So, and we've all probably known people who, uh, when they're hanging out with certain people, will take on the behavior of the people they're hanging out with. For example, if, if the people they're around use certain slang words, they use those slang words, that, uh, by the end of that conversation, they're, they're talking just like them. We all know people like that. And, or, you know, they'll be talking on the telephone and they're they're speaking normally just like they, they would to anyone else. And then they answer a phone call and all of a sudden they start talking completely differently because of the person on the other end of the, of the phone line. That, that's, that's sort of, the, it's a, kind of a silly illustration, but it's sort of the idea of, of me conforming my behavior to be like the world. But the issue here isn't, you know, slang or mannerisms or anything simple like that. It's, it's really... Uh, uh, the issue of sin. He, he says, don't change your behavior to be like the world. This is a command of Scripture. Christian, you're not supposed to be like the world. Don't be like them. In, in, in our culture, it, this is something that, 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 that we as Christians sometimes don't pay a lot of attention to. 
Uh, and there, there are many Christians who take pride in how much they are like the world. In fact, some churches, their, their goal is to be as much like the world as possible. So we need to analyze this. We need to understand this. But first, I think we have to ask the question, what does it mean when it says the world? Because if we're not to be conformed to the world, we better know what the world means. Otherwise, we may be missing the mark completely. But the Bible uses the word world in, in different ways. As uh, far as I can tell, three different ways. In, in our English translation in particular, the Bible at places uses the word referring to all people. An example of that is John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved what? The world. He loved the world. Well, that's obviously a different context and a different meaning than what Romans 12, 2 is talking about uh, because uh, he says God loved the world so much and then he says don't be like the world. So this is a different context and, and the world in John three sixteen is talking about all people that exist. That's what God loves. He loves the people of the world. He's obviously not talking about the physical creation. It's not that he's he loves, you know, the, the, the earth and the globe of the earth so much that Jesus died for the earth. He died for the people. Uh, that's why his son came. So, uh, so that's the first sense. The second way the word world is used is to talk about the physical universe. God created the world. He created all things. He made all things. And in that context, the, the world in that sense is a very material type of concept. However, the world is also used as a phrase meaning the, the non-Christian realm of influence where God is not reigning as king. So, so this is talking about any area of society which is not being submitted to God. That's the world in the negative sense, in the sense of don't be like the world. That's the sense he's using here. So it's, it's the world system. It's the world's standards. It's the world's way of living. He says, don't be like them. Now, I, I'm going to tell you something that I don't think is going to be a real revelation to anybody. But there will be pressure to conform. And you've ever felt the pressure to conform to the world in your lifetime? Maybe not today, but in your lifetime to continue living according to the script written by the world? That's one reason why I like the way J.B. Phillips translation, I hate to, it's not really a translation, it's more of a paraphrase, but it, I think he gets it right here. And paraphrasing, paraphrases are, are, are fine, but, but you have to understand sometimes they're not really sticking very closely to the actual meaning, but he, he does a good job here. But Romans 12, 2 in the Phillips translation says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. I think that really nails it. That's the world we're living in. It wants you to conform. It, I mean, isn't that what's going on in so much of our, our, our nation today right now? That, uh, you know, Christians that are saying, uh, I'm not going to do this because it goes against my, my uh, convictions. It goes against my faith. And the world wants to, you know, why is it that uh, a homosexual, homosexual couple that wants to get married is, is dead set on going to a Christian baker to make it, to, to make that baker bake a cake for something that he doesn't believe in. Well, it's all about that pressure to conform. And the world will put immense pressure on you to squeeze you into its own mold and its own image. And Paul says, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Now, with that said, th that doesn't mean that you can't get involved in the world. You know, it doesn't mean you can't be involved in government. But it means that if you do get involved in government that you don't act in, in the ungodly ways that some of the government leaders sitting across the aisle from you are acting. It means that you act in a way that honors Christ, even in the midst of that. It doesn't mean you can't get involved in a business, you know, and, and you, you can't be of the world because business is of the world, you know. It doesn't mean you can't be involved in a business that's working in this world to, to get money and to, and to provide for people. You can do that, but... You, you, you don't do it in a worldly way. You don't do it in a way uh, that the world does with greed, for example. You know, you, the, you, we do everything in a godly way. Galatians 1.4 mentions this concept well as well. It says, who, who, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, obviously that's Jesus, that he might deliver us from this present evil age 
according to the will of our God and Father. Now that's actually the same Greek word that's in Romans 12 too, when he says, don't be like the world. Galatians 4, he says that he might deliver us from this present evil age. That's the same word that's translated world in Romans 12 too. So it helps you understand that, that is the, the sense of this word and what it means, this present evil age. Now, the, you know, when we're living in this, there's this pressure to conform. But because of that, it naturally, we naturally begin to realize that Christians have a sense of separation. If you're a follower of Christ, I'm living in this world, but I'm, but I'm separate from it. As, you know, as long as I've been a Christian, I've, I've, I've felt this sense of not belonging. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The sense where I, that I just don't quite fit in in this world. And, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I think it's dangerous when we get too comfortable in this world, if you know what I mean. You know, but, but I identify less with this world. I don't belong. There's a, there's a sense of separation there. And this is what's called, a, it's a biblical dichotomy. Now, I like to teach words like that once in a while. A dichotomy is just a fancy word for when you separate something into two sections, into two parts. So if you cut it, if I cut an apple in half, I have made a dichotomy. I made two different parts. And you have the left side and you have the right side. And, 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 and you have one or the other, but, but, they're, but they're different. They're opposite. They're different. But they're two parts uh, and, and that's the deal here. So when we talk about this, this dichotomy, what we have is we have the world and you have the church. And, and that's the dichotomy among humanity. There's two groups separated. They're different. Even though they may look the same on the outside, they're different. Uh, the, you have the world and you have the church. Uh, you, you have those who belong to God and those who don't belong to, to God, the uh, so there's this negative and a positive thing to it. And according to Romans 12 too, I am not to conform to the world. I, I'm not to, I don't change my behavior to be like this world, to, to, the, to the ungodly living of the world, but I am to be transformed. So don't be conformed is the negative. To be transformed, that's the positive. The negative is don't be conformed. Positive is be, but be transformed. Now, why do I labor this point? I labor that point because there are many people, many Christians, and it seems to be, it, it, and I could be wrong, but it just seems to me as if the number is growing, but there are many people who think you can do both. They think that they, they, they say, I can be conformed to this world and it has no effect on me whatsoever. To say, I can be just like anybody else in the world, but I know Jesus still loves me. It doesn't affect my, my, my relationship with God. I'm still a Christian. They think I can be. Have you ever, ever heard anybody say something like that? Maybe you haven't. But, uh, but, you know, they say, well, I'm doing this ungodly thing, but it has no impact on me whatsoever. And I say, says you, <laughs> but not says the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible says you reap what you sow. So obviously, every decision you make is going to have an impact on you, one way or the other. You reap what you sow. Obviously, it will affect me if I make bad decisions. That's why Paul said, he said to Christians, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he, that will he also reap, meaning that we have to take offense. He said, don't be deceived. That means that's an area, that this is an area that we can be deceived in. I can be conformed to this world and... And here's the thing that we have to realize. To the extent that I am conformed to this world, I will not be transformed in my mind. The more conformed to the world I am, the less transformed in my mind I am. That's, that's the reality. That's the choice that's being made. When I yield to sin, it's not just a momentary issue of sin, but it's the effect that sin has on the internal person of who I am. That's what, that's what the scripture is getting at. Let, let me read to you some other scriptures on this because I think this is, this is just an enormously important issue. 1 John 2, beginning of this, verse 15, is speaking of the world, and it says this. It says, Do not love the world 
or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, obviously, he's, he's, he's not talking about the world in the sense of people because we are to love people. And he's not talking about the globe or God's physical creation because, you know, that's just matter. That's neither good nor evil. He's obviously talking here about the world in the sense of the, of the world system and, the, and the, the way that the world acts and thinks. So let me read that last sentence again. If anyone loves the world, speaking of the ungodliness that we see in the world, if you love this, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, now there's two ways to see that sentence. One way is to say that the love that the Father has is not being shown in me. But I think there's another way that says the love of the Father. I can say I love the Father, but it's not in me. If I love the world, I can say I love the Father all I want, but it's not in me. It's not true. Verse, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. The world and its desires are passing away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. James 4, we, see, we have another strong admonition about this issue. James chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. He, he, you know, some of these writers, you know, they, they would not survive in today's, uh, you know, snowflake cancel culture because he just doesn't, he just not, doesn't waste any words here. He starts off, it just sort of makes me laugh. It shouldn't make me laugh. Maybe there's something wrong with my sense of humor, but he says, you adulterers and adulteresses. I mean, how many of you would like it if I started off a sermon that, went, that way on, a, on church on Sunday morning one, one day? You know, I said, all right, all your dirty, rotten adulterers and adulteresses, listen to me. But he didn't waste any time. This is what he says. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Now, I'm, I'm not, I don't really mean to be teaching on these particular verses, but understand why he's calling them adulterers and adulteresses. Because he's saying, listen, if you love the world, you're cheating on your groom. You're cheating on God. You're an adulterer or an adulteress because you have friendship with the world. And friendship with the world is enmity with God. Let me read it again because the words are really powerful here. Do you not know that friendship with the world... Friendship with the world. And again, we're not talking about people here. We're not talking about God's physical creation. We're talking about the sinful brokenness that is, that is not uh, submitted to God's uh, kingship. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. And enmity is hatred. That's another word for that. Whoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture says in vain he yearns jealously for the spirit that lives in us. He, in other words, remember jealousy is wanting to keep what belongs to you. That's not envy. Envy is different. But so God doesn't want to share us with ungodliness. He says, you belong to me. Uh, and so the world here, again, I take in the sense of ungodliness. I, I don't think it means that I, you know, I have a friend who's not saved, so I'm a friend of the world. That's not what it means at all. Uh, because if we don't have friends that are outside the church, how in the world are we ever going to reach anybody? Right? We have to have relationships outside the church, which is, by the way, the longer you serve Christ, the harder that becomes because the more you serve him, the fewer friends you, you know that, ten, that, that, that don't know Jesus, which means you have to be more intentional about it. It means you have to intentionally invite people into your house for dinner who don't know Jesus if, you, if you're going to do this because that's just the natural way of things. We tend as we grow older and we tend to walk longer with Christ, we, we develop friendships in the church, which is good. That's great. That's healthy. But we tend to then begin to separate from the other people that need Jesus. Again, that's a whole different message. But that, that's not what it means here. It, it means, in this sense, friendship with the world. It means that I'm aligning myself with ungodliness in my life. Ungodliness, ungodliness is not just something that's around me. In that, in that situation. It's not that I'm in Sodom. It's that Sodom is in me. You see the difference? That's the thing. The world gets into me. And that's when I be, I'm becoming a friend of the world. I'll put it this way. You know, if your friend is surprised to find out you're a Christian, 
you're probably not doing it right. You're probably not doing this right. Because, because the, they can't tell any difference. They don't know any difference. Now, I read these scriptures to us because uh, there, there are many, many people who think, who, self-righteous, who self-righteously love the idea of being friends of the world. And, you know, I've met people who, who look down on anybody who starts talking about being sanctified, about being set apart, about being other than the things that are going on in the world. And, and they, they respond to that. It was like, you know, it smells like legalism to me. You know, and they say, oh, you just don't understand the liberty we have in Christ. You're a weak brother. And this is the attitude they may have. But, but, but when it comes to sin, there's no question that as a Christian, I don't fit into this world and I'm not supposed to be like the world. Now, I want to say this. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I think we have to be careful and realize that when, we, when we're saying this, I'm not talking about avoiding the trends in the world. There are things that are, that are trendy, like, uh, that, that, and we can't associate that with sin. We have to separate that from the sinfulness and the sinful ways those trends may be used. For example, you know, I don't have any of this in front of me, but I, uh, a number of years ago, I'm trying to remember the Bible teacher's name, J. J. Vernon McGee. Anybody heard of J. Vernon McGee? He does the... He still has this great ministry. He's been gone for many years, but he has, has this great ministry where he teaches through the Bible, it's through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee. Well, a number of years ago, you know, he, he uh, uh, it was during a time when uh, there was the explosion of, of, of rock music and they were using drums and rock music. And he, in one study, and most of his stuff is just wonderful, but he had this one study where he, he was talking about how, how drums were sinful. Drums, drums should never be used in the church. And you know you read that and you're like, where, where, what happened to you, Jay Vernon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't get this. Well, it's because in his mind, what was happening in the culture around him, he saw the trend and people were starting to bring, bring drums into the church. And he started saying, well, they use it there. So if they use it there, it mu- that must be evil. We can't use it here. And he didn't separate the actual sin from the, from the, actual, from the trend. That's just an example of it. So we have to be careful. It's not that just because something is new, that, me, that doesn't mean that it's sinful and worldly. We have to look at how it's, how it's being used and if it's being used in a sinful way, say, that's sin. Uh, you know, so, so that's like, you know, um, there are churches today, there are churches that really water down the gospel and really try to be like the world. But, but then there, you know, there are churches that, that uh, you know, have big television ministries or something. They have a lot of lights and camera and, and fancy equipment. And there are people that condemn that and say, well, they're just trying to be like the world. It's just a big production. Well, you know, no, they're just trying to do it with excellence. So we have to be careful with this and understand that, that what we're talking about with the world is really we're talking about sin issues, right? Uh, and like go, by the way, going back to the whole drum issue, anybody, I don't know how anybody can condemn drums and read Psalm 150. Because it talks about praise the Lord with the drum, with the cymbal. It talks about all of these things. And so, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's a different issue altogether. But, uh, but as a Christian, I am, I am deliberately, purposefully to avoid sin, uh, avoid being like the world when it comes to it touching any, anything touching the issue of sin. And that's pretty strong. Uh, when we read this concept in scriptures, there, there's an application to ministries in general. general. And I, I would give this word to anyone serving in any ministry. It's a word I have to pay attention to myself. But we have to divorce our ministries from the disease of popularity confirmation. Uh, that is, thinking that the numbers you see when you see a lot of numbers means you're doing well. Or that the numbers you don't see mean, mean you're doing badly. We, we, we can't do that. By the standard of numbers, the truth is most ministries throughout the Bible, were, by the standard of numbers, they were failures. You know, but by the standard of numbers, if you went back to Elijah's time, the ministry, the ministry that was really doing really well during Elijah's time was the ministry of Jezebel and her prophets of Baal. They had hundreds, hundreds of prophets. And so if you use just numbers to determine that, then, then you're going to say, well, that must be of God then. 
And, and they obviously weren't. That, but that was the big thriving ministry. And then there was Elijah who was like, I can't even find anybody else who loves the Lord. So, so trying to, trying to uh, use popularity or numbers to confirm your ministry, that's a bad way, bad way to measure ministry. It really is. And it's, there's a lot of pressure uh, on ministers today to do that, and, um, and not just externally, but also internally. Uh, you know, I'm an Assemblies of God pastor, and so I've been to many of the conferences that we do in the Assemblies of God, and here's the way it plays out a lot of the times. Um, you know, everybody, you go there and everybody says, well, we all know the size of your church doesn't matter. God is using you where you are, whatever. And then you meet another pastor, uh, and over and over and over again, when you first meet them, they ask, so, so where do you pastor? Uh, Mary in Arkansas. And then the next question well, how big is your church? Or like when I was back in youth ministry, that was always the first or second question. Well, how many kids you got in your youth ministry? You know, if I was a, a little bit more snarky than I am, I, I, would just, I would just start making up random numbers just to see how they respond. You know, like I'd be like, oh, well, there's only four of us, me, my wife, and two daughters. That's it. That's all we got. You know, or, or on the other end, I'd be like, well, we have 15,000. That's each service, <laughs> seven services on Sunday, you know, and I'm not brave enough to do that. But, but I'd just be curious to, if the rest of the time they'd walk around and look at you and say, that guy's only got three other people beside himself. Is he even really a pastor? You know, or, 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 or that guy's got 15,000 in seven services. Whatever he says must be right. That's kind of how we approach it. But we have to stop looking at ministries and thinking, look how big they are. They must be doing something right. Because you got to realize it is equally as possible that you could say, look how big they are. They must be doing something wrong. People look at the same ministry and they say the same things. It's just as likely that they're messing up and watering down the gospel, and that's why so many people don't mind sitting in the pews there. You know, I come in as an unbeliever and I never feel convicted. Well, that's not what I want in a church. I want people to be confronted with their sin. You know, I'm not talking about being mean and rude, but I think they have to become face to face with sin before they can repent. They have to. There's no, there is no, there's no repentance if they, if they don't see the sin. So you, it has to happen. You know, I'd rather have 100 people that love Jesus than 10,000 people that say, well, I'm an atheist, I'm still an atheist, but I still go to this church because I feel happy there. You know, well, that's, that's nice, that's cute, but, but that's not the point, is it? The point is not, is not just to have a bunch of people in a building whose lives are not being changed. That's not the point. We're not to be conformed to this world. In John 15, verses 18 and 19, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you must be doing something wrong. No, that's not what he says, is it? <clears throat> he, 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 said, he said, If the world hates you, <clears throat> you know that it hated me before it hated you. He says in verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, since I chose you out of the world, the world therefore hates you. If the, if the ungodly elements in society hate you and hate your ministry, that's, that's really not a big deal. That's what they did to Jesus, and that's what Jesus said they, were, they would do to us. So, so I say, don't, don't worry about it. If they hate you, they hate you. If they persecute you, they persecute you. Jesus said that would happen. So, and when we, when we realize this and we, and we really internalize that as truth in our lives, that is so liberating to us as Christians to realize I, I, don't, I don't have to please the Lord, the church, and the world. In fact, I want to please the, the, pre, please the world, I want to bless the church, and I want to reach the world. I, but I certainly don't have to please anyone except for the Lord. He's the only one I have to try to please. And that's really liberating for us. And, and we can just kind of ah, sigh in relief when we get that. But he says, do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed. Now that, that word translated transformed is the word uh, in the Greek, it's the word where we get our word metamorphosis. You know what metamorphosis is? You do whether you know that word or not. What, is a cat what happens to a caterpillar? Anybody? A caterpillar goes into that cocoon, cocoon and comes out as a butterfly. That is a metamorphosis. It's a change. It goes from one form to another. That's what it's talking about. We are, we are, we are on a journey of inside-out transformation as Christians. We're being transformed from the, from the inside out. We are being changed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 talks about this. So, so listen to this verse and think about how it relates to what we're talking about right now. He said, But we all, seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces as in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I'm going to read the concepts that I just read to you in that verse in reverse. I'm going to read it backwards to you in a sense because I think it helps the verse sort of come together for us. It says that God's Spirit is taking me from glory to glory and I'm being transformed into the Lord's image. And, but the first part of that verse seems amazing. He says, we're seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces as in a mirror. And if I'm looking in a mirror, what am I looking at? Me. So, so what I'm seeing is God's glory being worked out in me. I'm seeing His glory worked out in me. God's glory, I'm seeing God's glory in my transformation because I'm becoming more Christ-like. I'm becoming more and more His image. So, so, so currently, it is an internal thing. This is an internal transformation. Later on, there's going to be an external transformation that, that'll take place, right? You know, later on, my body will be renewed as well. And I will have a body that is fit for eternity, fit for glory. And I don't know about you, but I, I just can't wait for that. I'm ready to trade this model in for, the, for a better model. Anybody, can I get an amen? You know, uh, that'll be really nice. But Romans 12, 2, however, is speaking of the internal glory to glory transformation. The means for this transformation now is given to us when Paul says that we are to be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. This is the part we as Christians sometimes, we just, whether we, I don't know if we don't know it or if we just miss it or if we just don't understand the, the application of this. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, through 24. He said, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I like, I'm going to read it to you the way it's translated in the New Living Translation. It says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes Put on your new nature. What, it's that renewal of your thoughts and attitude is the process of putting on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Listen, we will never be truly transformed without this renewing of our mind. So now we talked about the meaning of the phrase the world, but now what is meant by mind? Renewing of my mind. What does that mean? Well, I think it, it means multiple things. It's, it's your way of thinking. It, it, it's just your general attitude about things. It's the way you think about things. It, it, it can, that word that's used there can mean your intellectual, uh, or excuse me, your intellect itself or your intellectual cap cap capabilities and capacities. It can mean your emotional core. That's included in the idea of mind, especially in the Greek it can also refer to the inner uh, things of, of motives and desires. Basically, it talks about everything that occupies your conscious self. And if that's my mind, if my mind is my emotions, my thoughts, my attitudes, my desires, my hopes, my fears, all of those things, all of that is included in the mind, then how do I get my mind renewed? Well, this work is done by God's Spirit in us. And the tool, we're going to start here. We're going to look at this two different ways. But the tool that is most frequently used 
is God's Word. As we memorize and meditate upon God's Word, our way of thinking changes. The more I get God's Word in me, the, more I, I, the better chance I have of thinking biblically. And as I begin to think biblically, I'm now no longer thinking worldly. And as I think, so I speak, so I act. You see this? Our minds become first informed and then conformed to the pattern of God, the pattern for which we were all originally designed. One of the keys in the Christian life is, is to be involved in activities that renew the mind. This comes down to choices. I choose what I'm going to do, and I have to begin to make choices to say, does this renew my mind, or does this fight against that renewal? The question then becomes, if, if I'm going to be involved in activities that renew my mind, the question then for me becomes, what am I feeding into my mind? What am I feeding into my mind? What you put into your mind is what you will get out of life. There's, a, there's an old uh, computer phrase back in the days with, from DOS. Anybody remember DOS? You know, and, uh, and uh, the programming and that sort of thing. There was, and I'm, I'm sure they probably still use it today because it's, it's just the general principle. But it's just, it's just four letters, G-I-G-O. Anybody know what G-I-G-O meant? Garbage in, garbage out. In other words, if you're, if you're creating a program, if you write bad code in, you're going to get bad information out. That was the whole idea in the computer world. And, and, and it's the same thing in our minds. Whatever I feed my mind on is what is eventually going to be coming out of my life in my words, in my thoughts, in my actions, because if I put garbage in, I will get garbage out. And, and there are Christians all around us that are struggling I mean struggling in their walk with God and yet they rarely read the Bible and, the, and they're constantly filling their minds with things that reflect the world's morals and values and they can't understand why they can't seem to live a, a victorious Christian life. They don't understand. It's like, I don't know why I can't. This is so hard. Why can't I do this? It's because, because you're starving that in, inward spiritual man. And you're feeding the flesh, the worldly outlook of life. It's because they're not actively involved in this process of renewing the mind. See, there is a connection between your behavior and your mind. And I see what I believe to be a key concept for the Christian life in Romans 12, 1 and 2, but, but it's also throughout the book of, of Romans. So let me see if I can take what I've shared with you so far and, and show you how this fits with what we've seen throughout the book of Romans. Ba based on Romans 1, I think I can say very confidently that when a person chooses sin, they become more sinful in the inner person. Uh, that, that's, that's, Romans 1 says it over and over again. It says things like they didn't choose to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a debased mind. It says that they chose sin, so God gave them over to vile passions, that the more they chose it, the more they were given over to it. So they became more and more wicked and sinful because of the choices that they make. They, they choose to sin, and then they become sin. Jesus said, if anyone sins, he becomes a slave of sin. So that, that's, that's obviously the downside, right? The, the choices I make about what I do with my body in the area of sin affect my internal person. Instead of, well, here's what happens. Instead of going from glory to glory, when I'm choosing to sin, now I'm going from darkness to darkness. I go downhill instead of going uphill. That's the issue. I become conformed. However, Romans chapters, that's Romans 1. But Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, gives us a completely opposite picture of this. In fact, this is really the reversal of Romans 1.28. It says in verse 1, present your bodies to the Lord. And then in verse 2, then your minds will be transformed. 
renewed. So just like in chapter 1 where we see them committing sin with their bodies and then becoming internally more sinful, in chapter 12 we see that the Christian life is living daily, moment by moment, for Jesus with my physical body and that results in the renewal of my internal person. So this transformation of my mind comes through these acts of obedience. Now that, that for, now goes back to the Word of God because we learn what the Word of God says and then we put it into action in our lives and we begin to live that out. And as I live that out daily as a living sacrifice for Him, then God uses that Word and transforms my inner person. Let me summarize this point because I, I think this is a principle of Christianity that nobody ever really, really taught me when I was a young Christian. When we yield our bodies to sin... It takes our minds along with it. Our inner person goes down that road and we become more of that thing. Also, when we yield our bodies to God, it takes our, our minds along for the ride. And we become more godly from the inside out. You know, some people say, people don't change. You ever heard anybody say, people don't change? Well, actually, based on Scripture, I would say people cannot stay the same. They cannot stay the same. What, whatever actions people take, they will be changed by them, one way or the other. One way or the other. There's a connection between your behavior and your mind, your inner person. Sin always carries a cost, and godly living always carries a blessing. So, so what's the end result? And here we get sort of to, to the hard part of Romans 12 too. Uh, by that I mean it's the part that a lot of people don't understand even sometimes even after going to a Bible study there, there, because there is a difficult phrase at the end of the verse, difficult in the sense that it's hard for us to get it in English because of translation issues. So, so this is what it says. It says uh, at the very end, it says that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we read that and we're like, prove the will of God? Prove, because we don't use the word prove in English that way very often, the way that it's used. It's a difficult phrase because we don't have a perfect English word to translate the Greek word that's, trans, that's used there that's translated prove. The, the, the work is, the, excuse me, the Greek word is dakam, dakam, excuse me, I'll get it, dakamazo. And it means to prove by testing to examine, to interpret, to discern, to demonstrate, to judge as good, or to approve. Now, what English word says all of that? Well, yeah, we don't, we don't have a good equivalent for that. Uh, and as I understand it, all these definitions, they all relate to one of three things. To, first of all, recognizing something for what it is. Second, demonstrating the truthfulness of that thing, like, like showing it to others or even to yourself. And third, endorsing or approving of that thing. So I see it for what it is. I demonstrate that it is real. And I approve of it. I affirm those things. So think of, think of that in place of the word prove. If you do that, you, you could say... That, that you recognize the truthfulness that God's will is good, is, is acceptable, good, and perfect. You, you, you could say that, that you may demonstrate to the world that God's will is acceptable, good, and perfect. You, you may say, uh, and then in, the, in terms of that, or after that, you, you may affirm the truthfulness of that fact as well. So you're recognizing, demonstrating, and affirming it. So let's look at all these concepts. First of all, recognizing God's will. Now some people... Take it to mean, if I'm being renewed in my mind, I recognize God's will as in, you know, I know if I should turn left or right at the stop, stoplight. Um, that's, that's not primarily the issue of God's will. Scripture emphasizes God's will for our lives in general far more than it talks about God's will for our lives in specific decisions we make. In fact, some of us uh, have the disease of not being able to make choices. Especially when it comes when somebody asks you where you want to eat. So, there's some people I know that it's absolutely impossible for them to make that choice. But that's neither here nor there. But, but you know, some people want divine direction for every single choice they make because 
They they don't want bad things to happen. God, you have to confirm this to me. You have to confirm to me what to do all the time. Well, I just want to say this. God would not have written the book of Proverbs if he didn't want you to make decisions. You think you hear what I'm saying? Because why would you need wisdom if all you needed was direction? You need wisdom to be able to make choices when you have to decide on the direction. God doesn't always give you clear direction, but he will always give you godly wisdom. Always. You know, now, now I, do, I do believe that there are many, many moments, there are many times in life in which God uh, does uh, directly lead and guide us in our choices. There are those moments, but there are other times when I seek the Lord in making some decision and, I, and then those, there are times when I don't receive any specific direction from him. Well, it's in those times when I have to make that choice that I, that I in wisdom, I, with wise counsel, I make a choice and I move forward and I use godly principles in my life making that, that decision. And there's nothing ungodly or unspiritual about that. However, here the main will of God that we're talking about in Romans 12:2. I think is, is he's talking about God's will, and that is that God's will is for our sanctification. That's in the context here. That's what, that's what 1 Thessalonians says. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, For this is the will of God. Are you ready? This is the will of God. You know, and somebody's thinking, Oh, am I, am I going to be a pastor? Uh, where, am I, am, uh, should I buy that house? This is the will of God. Oh, God, let it be Toby. You know, somebody out there is, is wanting this. This is the will of God. Then it's drum roll. Your sanctification. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. Oh, that, that's not so exciting. Well, it should be more exciting to you uh, than, than all the other things because your sanctification is a bigger deal than what you do for a living and where you're going to live. Much bigger deal. And, and this may be a shocking reality here, but the phrase that you, that you may be able to prove God's will, it might be saying, if you don't offer your bodies to the Lord, you won't even know what sanctification looks like. You won't be able to prove God's will. You won't be able to recognize it. Because, you know, and, and that's when you turn into the person who says, it doesn't bother me. My sin has no impact on me. I think I'm fine. Because you can't see, because you've become darkened. We recognize God's will. Next thing is demonstrating God's will. We demonstrate God's will in godly living, in the transformation that takes place in our lives. So I'm, so I'm proving God's will in the sense of recognizing it. I'm proving God's will in the sense of demonstrate it. So, so that means I live out God's will. I demonstrate it. Then finally, you, you, get, you get to the point of affirming God's will. And I think this is, this is a real maturity. When, when the Christian knows, uh, not only knows what is right and wrong, but they agree with that assessment. This is the point where, where put it this way, sin sort of takes on the yuck factor. You know, the ew, ew factor. Uh, in a spiritually mature Christian. Godliness, godliness, on the other hand, takes on the satisfaction factor for the spiritually, spiritually mature Christian. So the, so the immature believer has not yet learned how to approve of the, of the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For them, it's still about, you know, this is wrong. I really want to do it, but I'm not going to do it because God says it wrong, it's wrong. And that's, that's not a bad thing. That's a good place to start, but that's an immature place. Uh, but, but a spiritually mature Christian reaches a place where they see the ugliness of the sin and they no longer want it. And they say, God, you are so right. I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's affirming God's will. So there, there, there are three things that, that you need a, rec, a renewed mind to understand. So you're proving God's will in those three senses, but now you need a renewed mind to be able to understand these next three things. And you need to understand, you need the renewed mind to be able to understand that God's will is good, 
that God's will is acceptable and that God's will is perfect. So let's, let's unpack those. Uh, again, this is, this is not primarily about specific decisions you make in life. This, life. this is primarily about, the, primarily about the opposite of worldliness, which would be godliness. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed from the inside out. First of all, God's will is good. Is good. Now, one, one, one way of understanding this is to say God's will is morally upright. It's, you know, it's holy. It, it, it's what, whatever God wants for us, it's, it's right morally. But there's another side of the idea of good. Like, like I, I love to eat out, probably too much. Um, but, uh, but sometimes, I don't always do this when I go out to eat, but sometimes we splurge and I get a dessert. Anybody here, you like to splurge to get a dessert once in a while? You know, you get yourself a big piece of chocolate cake or something, you know, whatever it is that you, you really love. Well, well, and then you sit down and you eat that and you enjoy it. What was that cake? It was good, right? That's the other side of the coin of God's will being good. I see God's will and I understand that God's will is desirable. It's desirable. I look at God's will and I go, God, your, your will is good. I love it. It's desirable. It's satisfying. It's, it's pleasurable to me. I, 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 don't, I don't say no to sin like, no, no, no sin. I, but I want you so badly. But no, it, it, I'm just going to do good things and, you know, like it's a burden in our lives. Rather, it, it's that I'm going to delight in the things of the Lord because I see that they are so good. So the spiritually mature believer sees that God's will is good. It's wonderful. But God's will is also acceptable. Now that's probably not, a, you know, some translations probably translate it differently, but that's probably not a strong enough word because acceptable means pleasing. For us, you know, we use the word acceptable like, well, how is the food? Well, it's acceptable, which means it's like, well, it's not that great, but it'll do. But that's not what this word means. It means pleasing. It, it, it means that God's will is satisfying to us. You know, look at John 4.34. In, in John 4, Jesus encounters a woman at the well outside the town of Samaria. And he tells the disciples to go into town for what reason? Anybody remember? He says, go to the town because I am hungry. He was hungry. Uh, and, and so they go in the food into t- they go into food. They go into town to get him food, and and he encounters this woman. All this great stuff happened. There's too much to talk about that today. Then the disciples come back and and they're and they're like, "All right, Lord, we we, we brought you some food." But then what does Jesus say to them? John four thirty four. Jesus said to them, "My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work." He was hungry and he sent them for food. Now he says, I've I've got something far more satisfying than that. I've got something that feeds me far more than what what physical food can do to feed my body. He says, you know what is pleasing, what is satisfying to me? Doing my Father's will. And this is the mature believer's position. Now, I want to say this. If you don't feel this way... That's because you need to continue the renewal of your mind. As you continue to offer your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord, you stop conforming to the world, and you allow your mind to be transformed, then you you get uh, more and more this sense of satisfaction from doing God's will and just being pleased with doing God's will. God, I did your will. This this is really important for, for ministry purposes because... You know, when you minister to people, uh, you you sometimes look at their reactions and you want to be satisfied by their reactions, satisfied by the impact that you think you see. However, Jesus is giving us an example here, not to be satisfied by the impact that I think I see, but to be satisfied simply by the act of obeying God. And that's, that's a little bit deeper, isn't it? God's will is good, acceptable, and then... God's will is perfect. Now, just about any time in the New Testament you see the word perfect, it comes from a Greek word that can mean uh, not just perfect, but it can mean mature, complete, and full grown. So I am perfect in the sense that I'm fully grown. 
I'm not getting any taller. I'm a full-grown man. So I'm perfect in that sense, and that's the only sense in which I can describe myself as perfect. Um, when, when we speak of God's will as being perfect, uh, I think it's saying that there is a completeness in God's will, in the sense that there's nothing to add to it. God, I, I know you want me to do this, but I, but I feel like my life would be better if I just sprinkled in a little sin, you know, just a little bit of compromise. However, the mature Christian can see that God's will is perfect and it doesn't need anything added to it. It is complete. God's will is all you need. What, what is his will? To be sanctified. Some act like God's will is the lesser life instead of the greater life, but the mature Christian sees that God's will is the greatest life you can possibly live. The, the immature Christian or, or, or possibly the carnal Christian, they, they think that people who are living, you know, that, that really faithful walk with Jesus are just missing out. And they, they look at them and they say things like, man, I, just, I don't think I could live like you. You give up so much. But the mature believer looks over at them and says, I don't think I can live like you. You give up so much. That's the mature believer's mind. They see that God's will is good, it's acceptable, it's perfect, it's all of those things. But here's the thing, the world gets all three of these wrong. The world doesn't think God's will is ultimately really good. They think that it's as uh, uh, that it is. They think of it as oppressive, most of the time. The world doesn't think God's will is acceptable or pleasing, or that it's really satisfying. They think it's not enough. It, it's it's got to be more. And the world doesn't think that God's will is perfect in the sense that it it isn't the best life. The world is is so confused. So, don't be like the world. That's what Paul's saying. Don't be conformed to this world. That's the point. So having our minds renewed is focused on offering my body to the Lord, and this affects a transformation in my mind, but I need to make a decision to not absorb the worldliness of the world so I can be satisfied and set apart, satisfied in Him and sanctified and set apart for the Lord. There, there, there is hope for us. There is hope for us. You know, if your inner life seems a little messed up and your mind seems a little corrupted, focus on submitting your body to the Lord and let Him work on your mind. He will change us from the inside out. Get into the Word. Live out what the Word says. He will change. He will transform you by renewing your mind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. And uh, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to live unto you physically in our bodies so that we might see our internal self transformed more and more into the image of, of, of Christ from, from glory to glory. God, be glorified in us. Help us to become mature Christians who, who see the goodness of your will, the, the satisfaction of your will, the, the perfection of your will. We pray, God, that you would just give us clear minds and, and help us to live this way. And Lord, if there's anyone that they look at their lives and they say, you know what, I, I realize now maybe I've been conforming to the world and that's been stalling my transformation. God, let them make a decision today to say, Lord, I choose something different because our choices with what we, uh, what we do with our bodies is going to change the outcome. It's going to change us on the inside. So Lord, I pray you'd help us to make those choices and that we would not be conformed to this world, but we would be transformed. And we give you thanks in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.